Welcome to the Living Consciously TV show coming to you live from our Denver, Colorado studios. I'm your host and also your moderator, Coach Steve Toth. And our theme today is how our beliefs affect the human condition when it comes to our health. Let me introduce you to our guest cast as well as our health cast. And our guest cast today is Wanda Bettinghouse. She's an MD right here from Denver. Thank Welcome you. to the show. Thank you, Steve. It's great to have you. Thank you. And we also have Jenna Cook, who's right next to me. Yep. And uh, she's part of our health cast uh, as well. Absolutely, right? yes. And you're also from Denver. Well, actually, from Denver. our work in Colorado, <clears throat> which yep. is right just here in what, Denver. 30 miles, whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we also have our Skype cast coming on, Jim Gillette. He is our health cast member as well, coming to us from San Antonio, Texas. Hi. Welcome to the show. Good to see you. Good to see you. And also Jane Eileen Cohn. She is also our health guest member coming to us from that beautiful San Diego, California city. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve. Glad to be here. <laughs> Great to have you. All right. So the first segment, here's how our show will go. We will actually do an exploration and a dialogue with what the issues and the problems are with our beliefs about our health. Like also, what does it cost us to have all these different beliefs? which usually come from childhood, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then in the second segment, we will have a dialogue about what are the tools and what are some of the modalities that either our guest or any of our cast members have used uh, for themselves or for their clients that help them to transform their beliefs, right? So let's begin with our leading question. Do beliefs create more social problems than they solve? It's for you, Wanda. Yes, I think they do. Uh, if we look at our healthcare system, uh, most of the people in our country believe that they need to go to the doctor, get a prescription, get a diagnosis, then get a prescription, and then maybe have to take it for the rest of their life. And that is so firmly... Um, based in our culture uh, that that's why we're in so much trouble with, I can't quote how much money we spend on medicine in this country, but it's more than any other country in the world. Probably more than Australia, mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a huge market. Well, and of course we don't have to go very far. All we have to do is go outside. I don't care what city we're living in and see you know, how many Walgreens and all the other establishments that are either there or being built. <laughs> One on every corner almost. Yeah. <laughs> if it's not Walgreens, it's CVS or... Yes. So where is this going? I mean, you know, I'm not an MD. I didn't go to school to learn about that. But um, I heard some statistics, like when you prescribe one pill, what's the possibility that that pill will create other side effects and other illnesses? Well, almost by definition, there are going to be side effects because you can't put pill A into a physiological system and expect that it not affect the whole system. Mm -hmm. So there are going to be side effects. And some of the side effects may be minor that people just, you know, deal with, but some of them are more serious. So therein comes then the next prescription mm -hmm. to counter that. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's, it's hard to find people that have more, that only have one prescription drug. They usually have two or three. Got mm. it. All right, so this is what's fascinating. See if you can help us understand a little bit. So I think uh, on commercial television, there's a commercial every eight minutes. Mm -hmm. And I can pretty much guarantee put my life savings on that there will be some kind of a pill being sold to us, right? Yeah, I, I don't have a statistic on it, but I would just guess probably 50% of them mm -hmm. are, are somehow related to if you take this into your body, be it a cross-the-counter drug or a prescription drug, then your life will be better and your problem will go away. No, no, you know, I don't think they even say your problem will go away. The symptom will go away. Oh, no, they will actually say, uh, they will have a long list of side effects that they talk about. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, well, they have to probably legally. Yeah, <laughs> but what's interesting, yeah, it, it's yeah. almost like, yes. you know, do, do car salesmen sell a car by saying, uh, once you drive out of here, you're going to get into an accident. You could, and you could die. Do they do that? No, no, they do not. How is it that they can get away with that with prescription mm -hmm. drugs? Why well, is it that we're still listening? The same thing when, when you go to the doctor and get an operation, they always tell you you could die, but you know, they t that's for any operation or any prescription job they, uh, drug, they always tell you that, so you really don't have a choice, so people just sort of tune it out. That, that's correct. People do tune it out. Uh, a lot of that is from uh, med medical legal um, reasons. The doctor doesn't want to get sued. The pharmaceutical industry doesn't want to get sued. The, the hospital doesn't want to get sued. Interesting. So I'm hearing a lot of disconnection in all of that. Are you? Like uh, yeah. everybody's disconnected. Yeah, it's like the whole <laughs> the whole country. And I, I'm, so. we're only talking about our country. It certainly is pervasive around the world, but it's like we've all been hypnotized. Mm -hmm. And that's why this idea of what you believe in has such an impact on your life. Yes. When does it I, start? I have a somewhat different perspective. I wouldn't call it hypnotized. I call it... I, I'm a, a spirituality cast member, so I'm coming from a more spiritual perspective. Um, it has to do with a paradigm shift from my, from my perspective. So there's a difference between um, prescription drugs and holistic drugs. And I, I'm not sure if I can exactly define it, but it seems to have something to do with control. So um, holistic sort of requires you to, to be engaged. There isn't, there used to be the doctor says this and that's the answer, and if he doesn't have the answer, there is no answer. Now it's much more complicated to find an answer that really suits you. You have to be engaged, and you have to, have to be, um, more of you has to come into play. There's a less of a sense of control, more of an engaging than control. The old paradigm view has to do with physical control as being the solution to everything. And so that's why people take a pill as a solution whether it really works well or not, it's, it's how people can feel in control. The other option is, is a different way of approaching life that feels less in people's control. Um, I probably, this probably hasn't been all that clear because it's a really big subject that I'm trying to telescope in a few words. Does anyone understand what I'm talking about at all? Uh, um, you're you're making me think about it, you know. Uh, <laughs> It, I, what I wanted to say is, and when I hear y'all talking, it sounds dire, and I would agree when I think about it, it's probably true, but for me, I, I remember the first time I went to a chiropractor many years ago, and that was the beginning, you know, of me starting to understand other healing systems, and you know, since then, I, God, I've done so much body work and herb stuff and energetic work and all kinds of stuff that I'm very used to. And, and I will take a pill, you know, and I still go to doctors, but I just as uh, likely might go to a holistic doctor or an alternative doctor, all kinds of different things. And so I live more in that world and almost everybody I know seems to be more that way. So maybe I haven't stayed in close touch. I, I, those commercials come on if I happen to see them. I, do, I just tune them out because I, I don't have any prescriptions like that. Okay. You know? what, what I, I got that, but you see, we're, we're, we're to... attempting to speak to the listeners and the viewers right yeah. now yeah. Whom, whom are well, not tuning it, it out, all, whom to, are to actually watching that, it. You know, for me, well, that's what I was thinking about. What does it thinking about? What does it take for the person to start believing that there's alternative ways and, and maybe more... Um, balanced or holistic ways or helpful ways where they can get involved. That's uh, Jane's word, engaged. Where So what, what starts moving them over to where, just like Maybe. I and every one of us that are on this path, have, we, we had to make a bit of a transition away from popular culture to understanding we can take more responsibility and live real nicely without going to the doctor all the time. Maybe it has to do with our relationship with authority. I think maybe it does because the doctor represents authority. It's sort of very fixed. You don't have to think for yourself. He just tells you and you do it. Whereas a holistic uh, approach or the, the process that you went through was you started to take responsibility for your own life and making decisions based on your own direct experience. Now that's 
I would call that an evolved approach. It's, it's, um, for some people, it might feel like more of a risk. It means trusting yourself. It means that you can actually um, be in direct experience and know this is working for me, this is not working for me, I think I'll go in this direction. You are becoming your own, you're tapping into a, a, a different kind of authority. And that's a, that's a paradigm shift. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah but right now what we're trying to do yes. is to have a dialogue about what the issues and problems are yeah, so okay. the viewers can actually identify with uh, what we're going to be talking about in the second half of okay. the show, which are the solutions. Uh, that's when we're going to talk about holistic solutions. But at the first half, I, I would like to get a little deeper into how does this problem even begun? And, and I think it began at birth, <laughs> because some of it is genetic, some of it is what our parents are teaching us? Well, yes, we, we, we uh, l develop a belief system based on our environment and what we were taught, and so our parents also did, so it perpetuates itself, uh, but there comes a time when many people realize that this is a, a something's got to give. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way we help people, I think, move out of that is education, just like we're doing right now. We're talking about it. Right. I mean, there comes a time when, when teenagers, I mean, young kids become teenagers and teenagers become adults, and we start thinking for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we may no longer believe what our parents or society have taught us anymore. We question it. We begin to question it. That's right. So, so I think the, the value of the conversations that we are having uh, right, like on the show right now, is to, to have people see that are viewing the show, oh, oh my God, you mean, and I'm curious about that, and, and maybe you can give us some um, view into that from your own experience when somebody comes into your office. What makes somebody to actually come see you? Because they've been at other doctors, right? right. I, well, first of all, they've probably tried a variety of things. They've tried traditional medicine and maybe gotten some improvement, but they realize that, you know, they're not getting better. And of course, they're going to learn things from the media, from reading, from studying and doing research, that there truly are other more holistic, natural ways for them to heal. And that's what they want. They want a more natural way. They don't want to be taking medications for the rest of their life. Gotcha. So do you think what's going on in the world uh, in terms of medicine and in terms of health, how much of, of what we have created so far in the world has to do, how is it connected with money? What does money have to do with any of this? <laughs> well... <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot. I mean, you know, we can't get into the minds of the pharma, the mind of the pharmaceutical industry, but it is probably. I think it's the um, the what would I say the the richest uh, corporation in the entity in the world. Mm -hmm. they, there's a lot of money to be made in creating new drugs. There's no way around it. Um, I wish there's an article in Newsweek this past week about how much it costs for some of the new uh, chemotherapeutic drugs, mm -hmm. to, just that might extend a person's life for a, from a few weeks to a few months. Mm -hmm. uh, it was pretty profound. Um, so it's it, of course it's about money. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much it costs for them to actually create a new drug, but you know, uh, then to pass that on to, to us. And the, the point is, is it really going to make a huge difference in somebody's life mm -hmm. without causing them significant side effects? And the greatest side effect would be death itself. Mm -hmm. What do you think in terms of um, a lot of the other things that are happening in the world in terms of what we breathe in, what all the chemicals that we use in our kitchens, um, our all food. the things that we are eating, how is that has to do with, what I'm trying to get at, is there any connect, I'm just going to call it what it is, is there any connection between all these other industries, what they manufacturing and what we're consuming, and the pharmaceutical industry? Do you see any connection there as a doctor? In terms of what, it ha what happens to the human body? 
Not exactly. Or not mon- I'm not, not sure. Not exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> is, is there a closer connection between... Okay, so let me just pretend for a minute that I'm a farmer. It's going to be really hard because I've never been a farmer. <laughs> but I'm going to be sold things that I'm going to put into the soil, okay? Mm-hmm. And um, a- am I, as a farmer, am I going to be concerned about um, what's in the soil? And is anything that's in the soil in terms of chemicals, is it going to hurt humanity in any way? As a farmer, I would pray that you would be concerned about mm-hmm. that. Because do, you, do you think a lot of form, farmers are concerned about it? I don't know. I grow up, grew up in a farming family, and even though I would occasionally bring it up, um, my dad would say, but honey, that we're not going to have a crop if we don't put in sexicides and mm-hmm. pesticides and herbicides and fertilize it. And, you know, I'm pretty young at that time. I don't get into argument with him, but it has a huge impact because we have such a toxic burden in our body all the way from a newborn infant uh, Mm -hmm. already picking up the toxic load from the mother, Mm -hmm. uh, it has a huge impact. And so we're putting chemicals into the soil to grow our food. Of course, it's going to be picked up into the food. We ingest the food. The the toxins get stored in our fat and in our inner organs. And and unless unless we have our detoxification system at the very highest it can be, we're going to build up toxins in our body. Mm. And it's, it's huge. Okay, so It's a huge problem. Yeah, I, I get that. So I'm not sure, because I don't know how long it takes to develop a, a drug, but I, I just need to ask this question because I'm really curious about it. So is it possible that all the stuff that goes on in all these products that we are consuming, is it possible that the pharmaceutical industry somehow can be thinking ahead of it and say, well, we already know that all these things that are going into all these mm-hmm. foods and, and soils and everything else, we already know what kind of illnesses is that going to create. Is that possible? And say, they can be ahead of it and already manufacturing the drugs for it? I would have to presume that's possible, whether or mm-hmm. not that actually happens, because if you've got uh, liver toxic um, chemicals going in, you know, you're going to end up having a dysfunctional liver, maybe liver mm-hmm. disease, maybe even... Uh, liver failure, whether or not that you, what you're asking is, are they trying to create a, a pharmaceutical remedy for yes, what yes. they know you're, is going to happen? Now you're reading, reading yeah. between now, the lines. I, I yes. get it. But yes. Is that possible? I, yes, I guess it's possible. Uh-huh. You know, I have never, I've, you know, we ought to have a pharmaceutical uh, person here that would be very interesting. They what, would never admit it. What goes <laughs> okay, in? But, What's but, the intention? But it, <laughs> well, it's, it's like I could never get McDonald's to come here and tell me what's in the hamburger. Uh-uh, they will never no. do it. Can, can well, I ask something? Yeah. As a person who is into you know natural stuff and I take the responsibility for my health and I don't go to doctors very much, that's my orientation. But let's just throw this in. Um, how come the average age or the lifespan is going up in most countries and how many people, let's say, in older age in our country seem to be healthier, you know, and, and but once again, it might be because I just have a narrow range of what I'm seeing, but the average lifespan is going up. So how do we factor that in? I'll, you know, I'll be the, like the devil's advocate type point. person on this. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. <clears throat> So why are we living getting, longer? Living yeah, longer. Why does it seem like uh-huh. we're living longer and healthier? Um, you know, in the midst of all this, frankly, it sounds a little doom and gloom conversation going on about big pharma, big pharma, and the conspiracy of the the food producers and the farmers, large farmers. Um, how does it happen that in in, in some measurements? people are living longer and doing better longer? Well, that is a very interesting question. Uh, there, there are probably more than one answer, but what we're seeing as people live longer, they're developing more chronic diseases, more chronic conditions, and they're in the opportunity for more medications to extend mm-hmm. that. But if we are we looking at quality of life? Uh, of course, our culture evolves too. One of the the biggest changes in increasing longevity was just in sanitation and hygiene uh, when we ended up having indoor plumbing, 
had a huge uh, impact on mm. the decrease in infectious diseases as a cause of early death. Mm. How about lately? Because most of us have indoor plumbing now. <laughs> You're sticking to your guns, Jim. <laughs> well, you know, I, it's funny that I'm, I'm taking this view, but it's making me think about it. Now, the reason I think I'm healthy and I enjoy life at my age is because of all the alternative things I've done. It absolutely doesn't relate back to taking medicine for me, except one that I take. And I don't want to get into uh, a, a thing that I have had. I was, yeah. you know, had it since a child. But um, um, well, my mother is 91, and yeah. she she does all the medications. Although she she's sort of one who who chooses to do the least amount of medications, but she's on quite a bit right now. She's mm -hmm. doing pretty well, 91, mm -hmm. and her sister is 93. <laughs> And she's my, plugging up. My, yeah, my mom lived in 87, my grandmother to 92, and they were part of that traditional. But she's I would call that genetics. That was probably also some genetics. They just had good uh, good uh, genes, I guess. Um, well, I'm curious with the doctor. Is, you know, for so much about the pharmaceuticals, does a doctor get a commission for as many prescriptions as they write? Where is the incentive that a doctor will go and write prescriptions? Oh, I, I feel like I'm on the side of the street that I really don't live on, but I'll try to answer these from, questions. Okay, from your uh, experience and maybe, yeah. No, doctors don't get commissions for, for prescribing drugs. Okay. What happens many times is the pharmaceutical industry wants to treat the doctor well, so oh. they may say, okay, Dr. Bettinghouse, I'll send you to this seminar on this drug that we manufacture, and we're going to buy you dinner or give you you know, a weekend in Las Vegas type thing. So sometimes gifting takes place. So it's more like vacations. Well, that, yeah, or that, yeah, that yeah. happens sometimes. But if you walked around to the average doctor, they're not getting anything from right. writing the prescription. But they believe that they're doing the best they can for their patient. Right. I'm just curious of the hold that we have in our society about the pharmaceutical, where I know that there is a movement where people are coming to you now, mm -hmm. you know, to where that they're now looking like, don't do the pill or whatever, but is there another alternative to complement what I'm dealing with, which is a great movement? And you are yes. the exception, may I say, working in the medical field. Well, yes, and more and more people are trying to live a more holistic life, mm -hmm. eating better, doing the things that they know. And so there is a, you know, compared to how many people are using holistic alternative uh, therapies, Today, as compared to even 10 or 15 years ago, there's a, a, a big increase. And, you know, the whole purpose of even talking about this is that that's what we want to encourage people to look at alternative ways to help restore balance and homeostasis in their body without yeah. having to always resort to uh, synthetic drugs. Yes, well, and, I agree, and I but think I'm some still, of the traditional medical people are, are doing there, that as there's well. There's been this shift. Hang on for a second. There's been this shift in, in the pharmaceutical industry, and this is going back years, that they shifted from just marketing to the doctor, because you're the expert. Right. They're now marketing directly to, to the user, to, to, the, mm -hmm. to the individual. Why? Because the user, the patient, is going to go back to the doctor and say, I heard about drug X. Do you think it would help me with my mm -hmm. diagnostic problem? And so and I have had patients come, well, why aren't you giving me this? You know, I've, I've seen uh, reports in, in uh, magazines. I've seen TV reports oh, on Good Morning America, the mm -hmm. Today Show, mm -hmm. that this new drug might just be the solution to my problem. So the consumer, the patient then, would put some pressure on the doctor. But that's almost like saying, okay, so... Uh, that's almost like saying the doctors are too busy to keep up with what's going on and what's what's the new stuff that's coming out. Is that accurate? To some degree, perhaps. Mm -hmm. You know, they they're having to see thirty so, and so forty they're covering, patients. So they're covering day. all mm. their bases, basically. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Didn't used to be that way. Yeah, when I was in it, practice. It didn't. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't. It wasn't that way. You mean 15, the doctor is actually ago. not as aware as the patient of, about some product that might help them? I didn't hear that, Jane. What'd you say? Do you mean to say that the doctor is not as aware as the patient is about what product might help them? 
and that the patient say, knows this because of watching television commercials that doctors mm -hmm. don't, don't see. <laughs> I think oh. we probably need saying? to ask that of a doctor who's writing prescriptions, but I suspect that it might be true. Well, I think the connection might be is that the individual that's watching television is more invested in themselves and more motivated if they are sick or they're not feeling well uh, than a doctor would be because doctor is too busy. Uh, what's the average time that a doctor spends with a patient these days when they go in? You're asking the wrong person, but I okay, would but guess yeah, ten, um, probably 10 minutes, maybe. Yeah, 10 minutes. I mean, it varies okay. right. for specialty, but, you know, 10 minutes to come in and make that picture. Yeah. Wow. What hurts? Where does it hurt? <laughs> you know, how long does it hurt? What are you taking for it? Exactly. <laughs> okay. Interesting. All right. So, um, uh, Jane, did you have something to say before... Um, Couple minutes ago. Uh, yeah, but I forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> what were you talking about a couple minutes ago? <laughs> you asked a question about whether a doctor would not know a, the name. Anyone or have a, any memory a, pills? <laughs> about different drugs that a patient might know about, and I said I think it's probably possible. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of. Uh, uh, pharmaceutical agents on, on the market that every doctor might not know because p p my patients come and ask me about supplements, uh, have you heard about this, I just read about that, so what I end up doing, I'll go to the computer right then and there if I've never heard of it because there's no way for you to have heard of every possible <laughs> uh, remedy or you know supplement for what uh, people are uh, concerned about. So you have to, doctors have to educate themselves and some do and I guess some don't. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So I, I know that sometimes this conversation can be a little bit uncomfortable because we're you know, being somewhat negative and we're looking at what's happening out there and, um, but, but that's okay. It's okay to feel a little bit uncomfortable, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. this kind of stuff normally, you know, we, don't, we don't talk about on commercial television, right? No, and it's important. Yeah. It's really important, and it would it would be nice to have a, a traditional doctor talking to, because I'm trying to talk for them, because I was a tris, you know, practiced you traditional to, you medicine. One. You used to be one. Yeah, so 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and things were very different back then. They oh. were different to yeah. some degree, yeah. yeah. It, I, I don't know. It's probably very oh. difficult to practice medicine right now, yeah. traditional medicine. I yeah, got it. I think I remember what I was going to say before, cool. which is I, th I think that some of the traditional doctors are incorporating more holistic stuff. I know that they do in Kaiser, at Kaiser Permanente. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's actually Because they're what... finding out that it works better with less side effects. That's, absolutely. That's why we're talking about it yeah. and you know, why I talk about it all the time. Right. So, so and that's why Wanda is here, actually, because that's something that, that you have done. You have, um, you have crossed over. <laughs> <laughs> embraced. How about embraced? Embraced. embraced. Over. <laughs> Crossed over to the other side, which is, which is to look at, to look at medicine as as a holistic medicine. As th there's possibilities endless, right? There could be all kinds of possibilities. So you're very open. I mean, what I'm getting energetically from you is that you're very open. What could help somebody? Um, and there could be many different modalities. Very different. Um, tools and ways of helping people, you know, not just by, you know, here, take this pill and take that for two months and tell me. Absolutely. Right. So let's talk about those. What are some of the, some of the tools and modalities that you're using in your practice and what type of patients you work with that you use these modalities or tools? So well, my primary focus in my practice is, is uh, in my practice is, is uh, homeopathic medicine. Okay. And so homeopathy has been around for about 200 years, and it is, uh, it's really, to me, a premier holistic approach to helping people heal uh, because we're giving a homeopathic remedy that has, is, comes from a natural substance, been prepared in a special way so that it is diluted and, and going through a process of... Uh, making it safer because some of the homeopathic remedies, if they were given in their crude, undiluted form, could be toxic. Mm -hmm. But what we're giving is the, uh, essentially the essence or the ener energy of the remedy to help retune the vital energy of the patient. Okay. So, 
what, what are some of the most um, frequent problems, health problems, people come to you with that you get to treat? Well, they come with a wide variety of problems. Uh, a lot of people have had chronic problems. Uh, they may have things like uh, fibromyal fibromyalgia, mm -hmm. chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, migraine headaches, asthma, eczema, uh, gastrointestinal problems. It's just across the board. Yeah. Well, all right. Let's speak migraine headaches because I think I heard a lot about those. I never had them myself. But... Um, so how do, you, how do you help them if somebody comes in with migraine? I mean, that's a pretty easy one to talk about because it, it, it must hurt really bad, right? Right. The thing about homeopathy, it always starts with case taking. Okay. What does it, that look like? It, it's a two-hour interview. Mm -hmm. So I might say if you came to me complaining of a migraine headache, I would say, okay, tell me about the pain. Can you describe the quality of the pain? What does it feel like? Is it burning, pressing, squeezing, explosive? Mm -hmm. Where is the pain located? Okay. Does the pain radiate? Is it associated with any other symptoms? Okay. And then after I've gone as deep as... How about as, color? About what? Color. Is that important? Do they see color? Yeah, 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 or uh, what, everything about everything, the, everything okay. we can possibly understand about the headache or, or the chief complaint. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to go into everything else. You know, tell me more about yourself. When did the headache start? Was there a precipitating event? Mm -hmm. Now, see, I'm asking a lot of questions, but yeah. in the interview, I may ask a question or two, but then I want the patient to talk mm -hmm. because the way they express their symptoms will help me understand what, what kind of remedy is going to be most effective? Whether it, it's a remedy that comes from the plant kingdom, they'll have very specific language, mm -hmm. whether it's going to come from the mineral kingdom or from the animal kingdom. It's a fairly sophisticated system of case taking. Mm -hmm. And the bottom line is you've got to understand what is the common theme in the patient and then find a remedy that is most similar to that. They take the remedy, mm -hmm. we wait a few weeks, they come back, then we start going over everything. What changed? What didn't change? How did you feel? And of course you're going to do that through all the systems of the mm -hmm. body, but we just emphasize the, the headache. So, and Where do they get the remedy from? I, mean, what well, is I get from? most of my remedies from mm -hmm. Hahnemann Laboratory in California, okay. a specific homeopathic pharmacy. Uh -huh. very the way, cool. All the remedies are made uh, in a very... Uh, uh, what's the word, common procedural way mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. actually is regulated by the FDA. Not the remedy itself, but how they're made. Oh, okay, got it. So you've got uh, standards there. Almost like a compounding facility where they put things together and make the remedy? Not quite. Not quite? Not okay. quite, but they're, they are handmade. Okay. Yeah. So wow, two hours is a lot of time to spend it with is. somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's like hugely different. Um, hmm. From traditional traditional medicine, but that's a great picture. Mm -hmm. That's a whole list, the whole body, mind, emotional, mm -hmm. spiritual. That whole case where you see the whole person as a person. That's right. You've got to understand everything you possibly can. You know, we go back to childhood. What was your experience in your family as a child? How did you feel? Mm -hmm. Excellent. You know, what did you experience? Not where were you born and did, did, were you raised on a farm? Mm -hmm. Right. But you know, how did you feel? And they may say things like. You know, I felt totally alone. I felt forsaken, abandoned. Uh, I felt like nobody loved me. Uh, my mother was controlling me all the way down to what clothes I wore to school. All those things are important mm -hmm. in coming up with a homeopathic remedy. Uh, and I know it's, it's not easy for if you don't know anything about homeopathy to understand that. But if you sit down with a homeopath and watch them take a case and you understand a little bit about the different uh, yeah. remedies, then it makes more sense. Yeah. Well, we educate the public right now. That is exactly so, right. So at the beginning of the show, think? I think you said that you used to have a partner that was uh, medical in medical massage. Is that what I heard? I didn't know who was talking when I heard that. My business partner. Or, 
well, let, a medical let me go on with my thought. Therapist, so I was going to ask medical um, massage because I, while you're talking, I'm thinking about the way a traditional herbalist in traditional Chinese medicine would approach it. And I used to go into Chinatown every week and every other week for about a year and a half, and I'd see this doctor, and he just sits there, and he would take my pulse, look at my tongue, and get, go through some things pretty fast, then send me into the back where they had all these bottles of of um, you know ground up herbs and they they almost like fill a prescription and um, that's another system that is very different from um, you know here's the pill uh, but but their way of doing the diagnose I don't know diagnosis the 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 intake is very holistic and not along the same lines that our traditional Western medicine uses at all. So for me, I've, you know, I've been to a homeopathist. I've done a lot of Chinese, time, traditional Chinese, um, and definitely reflexology and body work and acupuncture, acupressure. So do you align with other natural systems? Do you, do you, are you in a clinic where there's other ways or do you, do you just go straight for the homeopathy, which I think probably you do in your practice, but do you, it, I know what led me to this, I'm, with all that intake, I was wondering about the, the energetic release of, of some of these patterns that are held since childhood that, that exhibit themselves in um, disease or disorder, but um, something like uh, acupressure, or acupuncture, or reflexology, do you utilize any of that or refer out to those, those systems? I would need to refer out because I don't practice traditional Chinese medicine or acupuncture. Now my partner, Dr. John Sloss, does some craniosacral work and mm -hmm. she's very skilled with her hands and uh, helping release stuck right, energy right, here, right, periodically. Right. Stuck and, energy, that yeah. gets it down to a, a know, single and, thing, you know, stuck energy, right. There right. are a lot of other wonderful therapies that if, if, it, if it seems to be called for and we're not making progress, with our homeopathic approach, mm -hmm. then we have colleagues that we refer to. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Actually, that's what that's what was coming up for me is how does a patient know what will work for them? Well, like first, what modality will work for them? So, do you think that a, a good way to begin is is do that intake that you were talking about the, the mm -hmm. two hour because that's like that's like the beginning. Like you got to know, like I used to be a consultant, so I do a needs analysis. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like the same thing. You got to know where you are right now, where right. that person is. Right. It is, right. That's very important. Okay. You know, no, I uh, see that. And it, there are not very many people, not very many healthcare providers that spend as much time with a patient as a homeopath does. Um, now, homeopathy is working at the vital energy level just like acupuncture is we're just doing it in a different way mm -hmm. but it's the vital energy as the, the the energetic field of the body mm -hmm. that is out of uh, balance that is causing the symptoms and thus the disease process if yeah, the, or, or, if or the symptoms yeah. are not uh, if things don't come back into balance then it goes into deeper pathology so okay so what I'm also hearing is that let's say we can we can agree on this probably that mostly traditional medicine is treating the symptom not not the core most of the time <clears throat> most of the time mm -hmm. yeah and so what i'm hearing also that here is that because you do spend a lot of time trying to get a picture of the whole person that that means to me that um you you will treat that person based on what you come up with after the, the two hours i mean you will have recommendations right right like i think now this is the next step and then right. if they don't respond uh, which is unlikely. I mean, how often does that happen? That the, the well, system it, doesn't respond. You know, healing is a process. Okay, <clears throat> and, and people are, are so used to having a quick fix. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Homeopathy is not a quick fix, unless we're dealing with an acute infection. And many times, within a few hours, the patient can be feeling better when they've taken a, an appropriate homeopathic remedy. Yeah. So let's make that distinction. So the quick fix is the pill, because it takes the pain away, right? That's but right. it doesn't heal the original problem. Heal. The original problem. Well, it doesn't get at the core issue. At the core, why, does, yeah. why is there the pain right. there to begin with? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, can I that. speak up for one other thing Please. that a person can do? Um, see, because I, sir, I believe in a daily practice, usually for personal development and uh, you know discovery. That's very interesting for me. But 
the stress reduction uh, qualities that, uh, that accompany daily meditation or some type of processing really helps the general health. And uh, I think of Herbert Benson, the MD that wrote uh, The Relaxation Response, and now he, he has co-founded the Mind Body Institute at Mass General, the Harvard Teaching School. And they, they work completely on a holistic way of combining meditation, exercise, diet, and they use cognitive therapy, but I, I prefer other processing methods. But all of this, and this is very measurable, there's probably the area that has the most research of how it reduces stress and you know blood pressure and cholesterol, cortisol, you know these chemicals, the hormones that come into our body when we're stressed out. We can reduce the, the things rushing through our body um, by meditation. And we can also do other things that we raise other hormonal um, functioning in our bodies that's very healthy. So I, I look at, at health for me is like an ongoing process and it's daily. It's not going to the going to the expert is what you do occasionally. They help set you on a path of your own improvement or they help you with an acute problem or a chronic one. But I think we have to take responsibility for daily something to be healthy, and that does include diet and exercise as well. Yeah, so. I would agree that daily practice is very important. Um, and also I represent, um, I, I'm a, um, a counselor, I'm an intuitive and transformational counselor, and so you know, a lot of times people's um, physical symptoms have a lot to do with stress. Mm -hmm. Stress is the basis of a lot of illnesses that people feel, and stress has to do with um, what I call limiting decisions. Other people refer to them as unhealed emotional issues. Um, I, don't, I don't call them unhealed issues, but there are decisions such as I'm not good enough or um, people are dangerous or can't be trusted or I'm not going to survive or there's, um, um, it's, not, it's dangerous to exist or um, I'm not lovable. There's all kinds of limiting decisions that people have made that can have profound physical um, Reactions. I've I've had people uh, who had asthma who no longer have asthma anymore because of the physical basis of, of it was removed, or chronic back pain um, because something was cleared and that resulted in what I mean cleared is a, a limiting decision such as uh, I'm not going to survive or whatever the decision is. Hold can can very often hold in place major physical symptoms that can be even life threatening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you mentioned homeostasis before on the show, and um, I, I would like you to explain it to our viewers. What, the, what is that, homeostasis, and how, what does it mean, and how, how does it work in the body? Well, it's actually the natural innate state of wholeness within the body, that everything, all the systems are, are in doing what they're supposed to do, mm -hmm. coordinatedly, together, communicating, every cell communicating with every other cell, doing what it takes to keep the, the living organism in absolute harmony, really. Mm -hmm. And I certainly agree with uh, uh, one of the uh, speakers about uh, a daily practice of meditation. And I do recommend that my patients meditate. There's a lot of things that I recommend mm -hmm. after we've started the process. Right. And, you know, the psychosocial aspect of uh, disease is huge. And yeah, I, I actually feel that, you know, just on my own journey, I, I began with um, just, just healing myself through um, my ability to process my emotions. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that, in general, women are much better at this than men. Um, most men really don't like to go there, mm -hmm. <laughs> would you say? <laughs> why what emotion? That? What emotion? <laughs> what, are you what emotions? What are you talking about? <laughs> Let's just go have dinner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, because uh, because most men are scared, scared, you know. Okay. They they just don't know. Speaking from my past experience, you know, I was scared that I would get hurt. Uh -huh. That's how I had it. Uh -huh. You know that if I if if I opened up and I and I allowed, my, I allowed myself to be vulnerable, I would be hurt. Mm -hmm. And you know, we don't want to be hurt, do we? Now, now no, what, happens, no really what happens in our system, how long can you go, like let's say in my case as a man, how, how long can you go not processing your emotions and not get sick? 
How long does that go? I mean, how long can our body right. stay in homeostasis before something has to give? Well, you can't go on forever, okay? Mm. Eventually. <laughs> I've noticed. No, some, some, I didn't. <laughs> you know, some people think stress it uh -huh. very likely may be the number one cause of uh -huh. disease. Oh, wow. And, of course, stress is going to come from not being able to handle emotions, suppressing Isn't them. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. What are you all stressing out about? Life. Yeah, life, money, relationships. Mm -hmm. Wow. Childhood. Uh, not yeah. feeling loved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Worried about, you know, how they show up in the world, relationships. And this is, that is amazing. Stress. And environmental stress, stress, too. Just the stress stressing up. Living Stressing in a, out over distorting our experience of reality, which, you know, again, so I always talk in terms of paradigm shifts, which people mostly don't understand. But the question is, if we are actually in reality seeing things as they are and not distorting them because of decisions such as we're not lovable or the world's a dangerous place or people can't be trusted or whatever, if we're not, those things, those decisions distort our experience of reality and cause stress because there's always some form of that life doesn't work and there's something inherently wrong with you. If you believe that to be true, which most people do on many different levels, that causes stress. I mean, mm -hmm. intense stress. And so it, it really means that if you don't deal with these emotional issues and, and get yourself undistorted or, emo in other words, emotionally healthy, you're going to be at, at various levels of stress because you're going to be living in a distorted world in which life doesn't work. We do it to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's, there's no other source it of any of it, really. Yep. It's us. Yes. It's, it's us. us. Yeah, mm. it's us, unfortunately. Well, it's interesting because then I look, no, you know. Because after... we don't have control over anything else. We only have control over ourselves. Mm -hmm. So if it wasn't ourselves and it was someone else or, or, the, or the pharmaceutical companies or the government or whatever, if those were the source, then we'd really be in trouble because we don't have control over that, but we do have control over ourselves. Wow, that's a huge so, message, yeah. I would say. Yeah, so, so I noticed that, that after I got more comfortable with my emotions and, and I was able to like, be vulnerable and be open, um, what came next is what I was putting in my mouth, food-wise. That's where I went next. That's what I looked at, and uh, that was amazing. Mm -hmm. And I gave up a lot of stuff that really didn't, didn't serve me. And then where yeah. I went next is exercise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how do, you, how do you find this? I mean, is, is, this a natural, is this a natural path like what I did? Or I think so. Is it? I think it is. Because I don't think that you could have looked at your food issues if you hadn't been willing to come into present moment. Food oftentimes is used as a buffer against feeling what you feel. Uh, coming into your actual experience. So until you've made a decision that you're willing to take a look at what's really happening, then you can't give up the things that are buffering you from, from that. That makes sense to you? Yeah, yeah, sure. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, like in a way, what you're saying is that the stuff that I was eating and the stuff that I was not doing, which is exercise, kept me in that place, which is not working. So. Wow, isn't this interesting that really it maybe what life is all about is mm -hmm. that it has it to work. It was buffering. Life has yeah. to work. <laughs> it's ongoing. <laughs> if, it's, if it's not working. Oh, and you have a saying, uh, Jane, about this, about life meant to work. Is that, yeah. is that it? Life is meant to work, right. Life is meant to so work. So when okay. it is not distorted, then it works. It's right. the distortion that, that right. causes it to not work. So maybe one of the messages to our viewers that if they are feeling that it's not working, like... Most people, even if they are not conscious, so consciousness is not necessarily a requirement to be aware that life is not working, right? It's not a requirement. Consciousness is not a requirement? Well, I don't think so. Uh, it's the way hey. he's using the word consciousness here. Yeah. Yes. Aware, okay. Yeah. Aware. Yeah, I mean, that's another pain. conversation, okay. but you I'm not that sure that work. that's a requirement. I mean, I could be not an awake and conscious person and still know that my life is not working. Yeah, right. literally, you can literally. see that. Yes, yeah. you can, you you can see it, know feel the source, it, You probably don't know the source it. of it. Okay. If you're not conscious, then you think the source is something outside of yourself and blame it on something, blame it on something outside of yourself. Versus if right. you're conscious, then you would have more chance to getting to the root of what's actually mm -hmm. causing you to have that experience. Yeah, you become more self-reflective then. Mm -hmm. You have that capacity yeah. to, to just say, hmm, I wonder why... 
I've gained 15 pounds in three weeks. <laughs> so how often does that happen in your practice when somebody comes in and, and after you work with them for a couple of hours and then you, 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 you give them some remedy and then they come back and then all of a sudden for that person, the light bulb just goes on and they go, oh. It happens. <laughs> it happens. And how does that feel for you? Well, it's wonderful. Mm. I had a woman come in for her first follow-up appointment of last week, and the remedy I had given her, I mean, she, she had so many symptoms, it was hard to pull it all together, but she came in and, and told me a pretty dramatic way that she had started thinking differently about her life. Wow. And she could, the only thing I've done is take that remedy you gave me. So, mm. you know, I'm always a little bit in awe. Mm. And... You know, when people, people also become more, they do become more aware, and they become more aware sometimes just as they're telling me about things. Mm -hmm. They start getting connections. Oh, I see. That's maybe why that happened. Mm -hmm. So it's a wonderful process. And and how often do you use your intuition and, and, and also connecting with your patients in terms of energetically? How often do you do that? Uh, hopefully all the time. All the time? Mm -hmm. Hopefully all and you the can time. do it even if they're not open? Yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. Th then hopefully the, the goal <clears throat> is to help them open up. They have to learn mm. to trust you. Mm. You know, people come and they do feel vulnerable and they're afraid and they don't know if they can trust you. Mm. Can they trust what you're suggesting that they do? And when they begin to kind of relax a little bit and realize that you're there with them in mm. the process, then... Lots of wonderful things can happen. Yeah. And that's the joy of practice for me. And I was going to say, I think what she does, she pointed out, is that you don't ask as many questions here on the show, but when you're in with your client your first time in the two-hour intake, you're listening to them. And that's right. huge because so many times we're never listened to. And so for you as an MD to sit and listen, mm -hmm. that's very powerful. Yeah. I may not say a word for 30 minutes. Wow. That's very I'm powerful. sure that's healing in itself. That's right. It is. That's why a lot yeah. of people prefer nurses in the hospital to the doctors. Right. The, yeah. the nurses are actually helping, yeah, because yeah. right. they're I think listening. The, the practitioner in themselves, if they are coming into the present moment, really being present um, in experience and relating to the client or the other person from that place of being present, it can sort of bring that other person into present a consciousness, awareness, in which you can be aware of more than you were aware of before when you were just flying this way and that way to avoid the pain or to avoid the experience, which is generally what uh, winds up being where the symptom comes from. So if you come in to actual present moment awareness and consciousness and are relating to your client from that place, it gives that person the experience of what it feels like and begins to slow down into actually looking at what's, act at what's actually happening in reality Great. rather than running away from it. Right, exactly. All right, so right before we started the show, you mentioned something that I think it's important to bring into the show, which is most of your clients are women. Why is that? Oh, you're asking some very hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> the, my, my personal belief, I think women um, are naturally a little more holistic. And I, you know, they... Uh-oh. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, wait a minute. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to get in trouble now. But, uh, no, no, he's giving you a hard digging. time. No, I think. No, I, I, think, I guess no, we'd have to ask them. Why, do, why don't they come Objectively, I would agree. Do you it, ever ask them? Just because I think women are more uh, in tune with rhythms, of, you know, natural things that are happening. Plus, giving birth has got to be one of the most gigantic natural things that men never do. You know, right. so um, I, I I think there's a reason for it, probably. But I'm going to speak up for men. I mean, we're hopefully out of all of this, guys are starting to understand that we have a whole system that we there's parts we need to develop and open up to. So um, I, I, I'm raising the flag for that. Guys can do it, but perhaps women do get a little head start in some of these areas. Yeah, fantastic. Well, hopefully. I will do whatever I can in the future to influence men to get on the bus because the bus is taken off and they better be on it, 
right. Well, your your biggest you influence would be to if you do it. <laughs> okay, so we're actually uh, coming up to the end of our show, so I just want to thank our guest, Wanda. You've been absolutely wonderful. Uh, so were you. Thank Janet. you. Thank you for and being so here. And so were you. It, it makes the show so much different when I'm not sitting here all by myself. There's mm -hmm. a really nice energy mm -hmm. and support, so thank that's you. wonderful. Thank you for, for doing that. And also, uh, I want to thank all of our viewers as well uh, to be with us, and of course our cast, and everybody behind the glass. And just want to remind everybody that uh, if you vote on our shows, the more you vote, the more it's being played on Channel 56, 57, and Channel 219. And don't forget to visit us on livingconsciously.tv and uh, interact with us there. Uh, join our membership site, and uh, let's... Um, Let's do this. Let's um, work on being healthy because without our health, I believe we really don't have anything. I agree. Yeah. I agree. So thank you very much. And we'll see you, of course, uh, next week, same place, same time, in our Denver studio live with the Living Consciously TV cast. Thank you so much. Thank you. you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.